said, uh, my name is Vin Saicapino. I've been working with uh, PHR for 23 years. It's uh, much of our work has focused on uh, the docu investigation and documentation of torture. Uh, just as a matter of context for Dr. Hamzi's uh, presentation, PHR has been doing uh, torture documentation for some 25 years, and I wanted to mention the types of work that we've been doing. Uh, many times it's investigations in uh, other countries. In the course of doing that work, uh, we help to lead the development of international standards for effective legal and medical investigation and documentation of torture. Uh, you, I think you know what I'm referring to, the Istanbul Protocol. And um, after developing that UN, those UN standards, um, we have tried to implement Istanbul Protocol uh, standards for documentation in many, many countries, uh, some 30 countries or so. And uh, actually, at this point, we are working with the UN to develop uh, a, a roadmap for states on how to do that implementation work. Um, much of PHR's uh, work is international, but we also do domestic anti-torture work. Uh, we have a, a robust asylum network of clinicians who document uh, uh, medical evidence of, of torture and treatment for asylum purposes. We also have a very active program um, documenting torture that was uh, done by the United States in the context of national security settings. So um, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Hamzi uh, in, three years ago when we had a, a Istanbul protocol training on uh, uh, for MENA, uh, MENA experts. And so she's going to talk to you today about her experience of documentation in Lebanon. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, my dear Dr. Snow, for your lovely introduction. A lot from you during Istanbul. I would like to thank Physicians for Human Rights, who gave me this opportunity to share our experience in documenting torture in Lebanon. Special thanks to Dr. Ziad and Elizabeth, who arranged for this meeting and made it possible. And for all, all friends and colleagues who, who took time to share with me and to share with us this experience. Thank you so much. This picture, written by VOT victim of torture, illustrates a victim being forced to confess or sign something he or she have not done in the first place. Lebanon is a democratic state. Two neighboring countries have affected the stability of our small country at political and security level. The Syrian occup occupation which lasted for around 30 years. The Israeli occupation of South Lebanon, the national civil war, all these factors lead to a cultural tolerance on violence. The Lebanese state continues to deny the security forces systematically abuse detainees and practice torture during investigations knowing that torture is illegal under all circumstances, even during emergencies. Lebanon is a state party in the United Nations Convention Against Torture, torture since the year 2000. This treaty requires that the state ensures that those who engage in acts of torture are subject to punishment, that victims of torture have access to justice and a mechanism to receive compensation. Unfortunately, Lebanon has failed to respect its international obligations at many times. The Lebanese civil war 
lasted for around 25 years. That kept violence in a continuous way. This has become part of the law enforcement personnel's daily practice. Here comes the importance of documentation. The, consist the, cons the consistency, we have to prove the consistency between the person's own story and the psychological and physical findings. The degree of consistency between the torture story and the symptoms that the, that the individual report should be evaluated and described in the report. This is raises consistency decrease doubt. What is beyond harm, harmful in this picture is the sense of the doctor, the doctor who, who witnessed the torture, who is in the process of the torture. So around to Hippocrates, first of all, do no harm. Many health professionals have dual obligations. The principle of care ethics make it, make, make it clear that the primary loyalty is to the patient. Doctors would be asked to perform medical examination prior to interrogation in order to verify the individual, be able to withstand the torture other individual during an abusive interrogation. They may be asked also to provide medical knowledge or individual medical information concerning physical health or to identify psychological weaknesses or fears that can be exploited in order to facilitate interrogation. They can develop or even create, create new methods such as the scandal psychologists James Mitchell and Bruce J. The report which has lifted the veil about the torture techniques applied by, by the CIA against 9-11 suspects. Could you imagine that the torture program was designed supervised and managed by two sides. They had received 100 US dollars for their, I don't know if we can say, efforts. They were involved in some of the most brutal interviews to www.vanityfair.com. According to Tokyo Declaration, 2006 New Declaration, the physician, the physician shall not use, nor allow to be used, as far as he or she can, medical knowledge or skills or health information specific to individuals to facilitate, to facilitate or otherwise aid any interrogation, legal or illegal, of those individuals. As you see in the picture, this is a green light to take the, the approval of the patient before starting anything, any kind of interview or documentation. We have to take his approval and then his consent in order to do no harm. Doctors and health professionals should maintain confidentiality and not break it unless with the person's consent. The client should be clearly informed about the limit of confidentiality during the interview. There are, there, there are many levels of, uh, of challenges. I start with the challenges on the level of the victim of torture. torture silences the victim. 
alleged victims are identified during the treatment. Alleged victims were subjected to torture long time before approaching this center as starting the treatment. They are not aware about their right for redress and compensation. Alleged political victims are scared to share their stories. An average of one out of ten accept to document their case. Lack of awareness of the legal value of documentation. Lack of protection to secure the safety of the victims. Lack of trust. Alleged victims are scared for reprisal. Sure, they are scared. Individuals who refuse documentation are avoiding to relive the horrible experience. That's why, that, that's why we have to take into consideration the danger of repetitive trauma feeling. We should try to find a balance between two basic necessities. The need to obtain useful information and the need to respect the interviewees needs. We had document, documented in 2013 19 cases and 20, 28 cases in 2014 and 15, two cases in 2015 according to Istanbul protocol. But Unfortunately, none of the cases did or had the courage to take their file to court of justice. Now I talk about I will talk about the challenge on the level of judicial system, lack of trust in the judicial system to have reliable witnesses, the report shall hold legal value, the absence of a law crime analyzing torture. The United Nations Convention Against Torture is not implemented on the national level. Judges refer to UNCAT in very limited and rare cases. Article 14 on the UNCAT is not adopted in implementing and or implementing yet. Now that's the challenges and the big challenges. There are our challenges as professionals. It's challenging to have a professional team trained on the use of the Istanbul protocol, at least in Lebanon. I don't know so sure, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Prince uh, uh, know very well that there are many professionals who can do it. Another challenge team that believes in the fight against torture. Lack of action system aim to avoid any kind of reprisal against the, PT, the professional who becomes. Absence of physical antagonization of the alleged victims and the report are time consuming. To gather reliable and accurate evidence on torture allegations long time is a major challenge. Producing high quality Latin medical reports to be submitted, reaching conclusion on the consistency of the medical and psychological. What we see in this picture this is to know if the symptoms or the story fits with the finding, with the physical finding. So we have a lot of conflict sometimes, not necessarily, that the allegation of torture and not really. 
de urinar. E aí? Do you hear me? Ok, já solto. Test, test. Ok. So, I repeat. That means the absence of culture are not difficulties. Survivors of torture may have difficulties remembering and retelling some of the details of their torture experience and other parts of their stories. This is due to various factors. Factor Factor Anxiety. Cultural factors. Factors. in the report. This is, of course, raises consistency and decreases up. Each e evaluation of the al alleged victim must include psychological assessment. Psychological assessment can provide significant evidence of the occurrence of abuse. One of the main objectives of torture is to break the psychological and social cohesion of the individual and thus his or her performance. All methods of torture include elements of psychological torture. Physical torture often practiced without leaving physical traces, while the effect of psychological torture lasts for longer periods. As you see in the picture, we have to pay attention. It's, it's very important to recognize that not everyone who has been tortured develops a diagnosable mental illness. There are many factors affecting the psychological consequences of torture, regardless of the social con context before and after torture. Maybe I don't have time to, uh, to talk about all these factors, but I would like to talk a little bit about the meaning of torture. If I am tortured because it goes before, in, in order, because a cause, so the torture have a meaning. But if I am tortured by coincidence, I am in the right place, uh, in the wrong place, so it's really sad. What torturer said to victim? I will make you worthless. You will be important. Even if you talk about what's happened, nobody can believe you. What does the victim say? I do not trust anything nor anyone. I am threatened. I feel I am no more in this world. No one in this world. Life is meaningless after today. The world is not as you think or as I think. I have lived what nobody has ever lived. The individual is no longer able to secure even to himself. I am no longer the same.
this is also this picture is illustrated by trying victim of torture who was abused to sexual abuse. So So she felt that she is naked and everyone see her like that. For this reason, we should be not judgmental. We should not maintain stiff clinical neutrality. Interview should be very empathic versus objectivity. Silence is the accomplishment of torture, so therefore at least our center we try to break the silence. We try to establish forensic and psychological examination units in people in North Lebanon. The aim of this activity consists on giving execution to the to the obligatory need to guarantee a medical screening to each person who is subjected to an investigation process through the establishment of independent forensic and psychological examination units inside the Dushin Palace, where most of such violations take place. This is new in Lebanon. This division is to screen habitation services to document cases based on the content of the person deprived of their liberty, to de develop case case to, to be presented to the court, and I hope we can present some case to the court during 2016, especially that we are in the place that where uh, torture can be. To share with, investi with investigating just the medical examination report based on the content of the individual, the center will develop an annual report, report on all activities. It's a pilot project. The report will be shared with the Ministry of Justice and the General Prosecutor. All information included in the report will form a notice for the judicial system in order to launch investigations. Mapping of all police custodies which practice torture during inter investigation based on information gathered from detainees. The project will be evaluated in two years and similar initiatives will be implemented on the left, on the national level. <laughs> I end my presentation by sharing with you some written thoughts by one of my patients, victim of torture. He is describing the tears I end my presentation by sharing with you some written thoughts done by one of my patients, victim of torture, describing his tear inside the prison. He said, a teardrop is a moment of impartiality through which you can see the world from a human perspective. When a teardrop falls down your face, you feel alive and can feel your body again, a sense which you would have lost in detention. It's a continuation of life. A teardrop in detention is unlike any other drop, as it is the mirror in which you perceive yourself with full honesty. 
to see the world the way we should see it. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'm ready now for the question. Thank you so much, Sana, for uh, this presentation. And I want to apologize for those who had some uh, issues with the sound, as uh, we all know that the connection out of Lebanon sometimes can be a bit slow. But thank, uh, thanks to everyone for attending. And uh, you can start asking questions in the chat box. There is a chat box uh, in the software you're using to attend this webinar uh, where you can um, comment and send any questions you may have. So I'm waiting. Uh, the first I'm waiting. Yes. we received, Sana, is from uh, yes. Christina Papadopoulou. And she says, Wow, hello, Christina. <laughs> she says, Dr. Hamza's excellent presentation generates many questions. Given all the challenges that she mentioned regarding the documentation of torture, I would like to ask and, and how Restart is selecting cases in order to pursue strategic litigation, um, in order to pursue strategic litigation in domestic courts. What's their experience regarding that? So the question is regarding the selection of cases, Sana. Which ones you choose to go to court and which ones you kind of don't choose? Okay. It's based on the consent of the patient. And as, as I mentioned, patients still now in Lebanon scared from reprisal. So we cannot uh, submit any case to the court of justice till now. But for example, I have made a lot of cases outside Lebanon, and they were they were uh, okay submitted to the court, but it's not an Arabic country. This is very difficult to submit a case to the court. So I don't know if I answered the question of Christina. Um, another it's question. Based on the content, yes, of the person. But how we select them? Victim of torture came to this start. We can we can ask them if they like to make documentation for their cases. But as I mentioned, one out one out of ten people only accept to document their case. And even that, they don't they are, they scared to submit their cases to the court. So we fight and restart center. We have now this uh, uh, this place in Justice Palace in order to submit some cases to the Court of Justice. Okay. Well, I'm going to move to the next question uh, because Christina said yes. Thank you. Uh, Malak Al Hassan says, "Are refugees in Lebanon at high risk of being subjected to torture and mistreatment compared to the Lebanese nationals?" Sana, can you hear me? Malak, okay, okay, I hear you. Malak works with refugees, and she is very uh, uh, empathic with refugees, for sure. Uh, yeah, in Lebanon, uh, there are some, uh, some, uh, where I say, practice of torture, but it's not like uh, the refugees and uh, the other countries. So it's very, uh, uh, it's not to compare between Lebanon and uh, and other. Uh, and other Arabic country, and also, I would like to add that victim of torture, who is refugees, he he doesn't have any support. As I mentioned, for example, family or community support, or for example, even he doesn't have home. He's homeless. He needs basic needs before starting talking about his torture. So we have to start from the from the from the base, from the zero to let them uh, arrive to, to speak and to break his silence and talk about his torture. OK. Uh, another question from Christina Jones. She says, uh, very interesting. May I ask, do you think that you must have a diagnosis of PTSD or major depression to prove torture, or would an adjustment reaction be sufficient?
Sorry, sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question. Yeah, is, now I see you. Okay. Is asking. Yeah. Uh, you need a diagnosis of PTSD or major depression to prove torture, mm. or an adjustment reaction is sufficient for you to prove torture. Or should things actually? Oh. No, no, it's not. I have to find the symptoms, and if the story is related to the symptoms. And I have to find if the symptoms are uh, reliable and accurate according to, for example, the SM4, because the whole protocol is not adapted now, uh, the SM5. I see physicians from human rights start to do something to adapt the SM5. Maybe Vance also can intervene. Please, Vance, if you have something to, to say in this issue. Well, <clears throat> uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, with the new DSM-5 criteria, uh, we are using that uh, for uh, th either threshold symptoms or diagnostic criteria, also ICD-10. Um, but having said this, uh, to answer your question, no, you don't need uh, uh, to have symptoms. As, as Sana said earlier, you don't need to have uh, any psychological reaction other than your own to have evidence of torture. Some people are more resilient and they may have no psychological symptoms. And I know that state actors sometimes try to use the absence of psychological evidence as a way of exonerating police. We saw this in Mexico. And uh, the Istanbul Protocol makes this very clear that the absence of medical evidence of torture, psychological evidence, it should not be taken to mean that torture did not occur, right? The objective of a good psychological evaluation is to understand who that individual is and how, what the meaning of that experience was. I mean, I've worked with people who are political activists who were tortured and they were very resilient. They didn't have psychological symptoms, their physical symptoms dis disappeared. Um, I, I think a, an experienced clinician can show why there may not be physical evidence and or psychological evidence, and that in itself is a corrupt way of corroborating uh, the the uh, the alleged victims' allegations. Does that help, Christina? I think that Can helps. I... Uh, responding also to the question of uh, Elian Arida, who asked the same question, she said, "If there are no yeah. physical and psychological evidence of torture, how can you determine that the victim was tortured?" Yeah, yeah. If I'm if I may, I, I want to also add uh, uh, an answer, uh, add to, to Sana's uh, answer to the question of strategic litigation. As Sana has mentioned in the Lebanon experience, and it's true in so many countries, that uh, you're dealing with a system where, conf you know, there are no legal investigations, and it's a confession-based system, and the, the forensic experts who work for the state are... Uh, they don't use the standards. The judges don't qualify according to uh, real experience. This is one of the reasons why we developed a framework uh, to guide people to, to have standards for, for investigation. Um, even though your evaluations may, may be one of the most powerful ways to corroborate a victim's allegations, you have all these other problems, you know, the police as perpetrators, uh, judges who are corrupt, and so forth. So I want to say that in my experience, uh, we've dealt not only with individual documentation, but we've tried to change the laws and policies and procedures which facilitate these practices and the lack of accountability. So it's really important, I think, not only to wear the hat of a medical or a clinical provider and documenter, but also to get involved with um, the legal the policies that uh, facilitate the practices and so forth. It's more than just doing the clinical work of evaluation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vince. Um, another interesting question coming from uh, Khaled Dubali. He asked, uh, do, you, can you, do you have any idea on the psychological impact of those actually practicing torture? Uh, 
Yeah, and I know, guys, you know, at Lebanon, we have made a lot of, we have made a lot of training for, the, for, for, for police, for police and for the uh, security, enforced, for security, Lebanese for security. Uh, in their mind, they have like uh, conviction that it's the easier way is to practice torture, to get more information. We try to do our best to let them change a little bit their, uh, their conviction, but uh, really it's, it's hard. And personally, on my last, last uh, training, I told them clearly that really I am afraid to train you. Because sometimes I feel that really they are so uh, aggressive. So it's a culture, as we say, this is legacy about torture. In Lebanon, because of the war and the 25 years war and the occupation of Syria and Israeli and everybody tortured everybody, so it becomes like uh, it becomes like uh, a, a culture. We work a lot with them, but uh, we start to, to make something like uh, like about uh, talking about them themselves. Them make something like psychological debriefing, like um, uh, care for caregivers, because also a very, very bad situation, even the, the officers and the torturers. We start to, uh, to be empathic with them in order to let them be also empathic with other victims and to change their uh, methods. I don't know if we can reach. Also, the director had a lot of uh, experience about this issue, so I would like to, uh, to ask her to intervene. Um, I don't know, Mr. Khaled, if I answered your question. Yeah. Uh, another question coming from Elizabeth McNeil. Uh, she actually saying that if the most of the violations are happening in Lebanon, how was the creation of a, such a unit like Restart allowed if the violations are occurring in the very same location? I let the director of Restart answer this question, okay? Well, uh, Hello, everybody. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, uh, I can, if I want to answer uh, your question, Elizabeth, it's uh, really it's a very challenging uh, project. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a work of years with the government and with the, specifically with the Ministry of Justice to really to achieve this agreement after one year and a half discussing the contract and the agreement. Um, and finally, they, they are obliged, they cannot say no, but they always, there is something new and come again to negotiate and it's, 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 it, was, it was a very long process, but still now we have the contract the centers uh, now under the equipment and um, hope that will be, uh, in my opinion, it's a very important project on the prevention. Restart worked for, from 1996, 20 years working in providing the habitation services, but never we can really achieve something on the prevention level. Even if we have a component in our scope of work on the prevent, on the lobbying and advocacy, but today, I can say that it's an amazing project. It will be fantastic if we, if we really uh, start. And uh, guarantee the nation people who the Hello? You hear me? Yeah, you, now? you can, can, I, the can I continue? Yes. You can Great. Go. Yeah, uh, this project will be, we, if we guarantee the examination and will have this access, the, the center will be near the, uh, near the police station and all people will be arrested, want to be referred to 
the files of justice on uh, every day and to be investigated by the judge and the, the example also interviewing uh, interview and uh, uh, the social worker will can you hear me or there is yes yes a problem can, also? Actually, Again? I, actually before you finish your answer um, uh, I would like to ask another question related to the center asked by Stefan Schmidt who asked uh, uh, who is funding actually the center uh, right now where, where are your funds coming from Ah, the fund is the Marine Commission. It's under a project funded for three years' lifetime, and it's one of the components of this project. The project is uh, implemented with the three uh, partners: one in Jordan, another one in uh, in, uh, in Geneva, APT Association for the Prevention of Torture, and uh, Ajam in Lebanon, and they start to lead the project. Um, thank you. Uh, another okay. question from uh, Kiran Deep Kaur. Uh, he uh, actually asking if these cases aren't presented to the court system. What happens with the documentation? Yeah. Are there other venues to get justice for the victims? Excuse me, can, can you repeat? So if the, most of the cases, actually, Dr. Sana said, are not going to court, are not presented to the court system. Yeah. So what happens with yeah. the documentation? No, no, no. Now we... Yes, in this center, it's a new approach. Before this center, it was the case when Sana mentioned it, what Sana mentioned, yes. In reality, now it's different. We are inside the palace of justice. We are in direct contact with the prisoners who, in, during the first period of arresting also, uh, in, the 24, in the first 24 hours or 48 hours, should we refer to this place. And, uh, the scale of torture is still present if there is kind of, if there is torture, huh? physical torture and or psychological even. And uh, now uh, all information, it's a, it's a part of the system, cannot ignore what we will find or what we will document because all documents will be, uh, the, the examination will be part of the file uh, uh, of, the, of the prisoners or the inmates to be presented to the to the judge before the investigation period with the judge, they cannot ignore it. Now it's part of the system. For this reason, it's a it's a, in my opinion it's a very advanced tool in pre for the prevention of torture. Um, thank you. Another question uh, from Khaled Dubali is asking about the numbers. Do, do you have any ideas on the numbers of people who are tortured? Can you give us any ideas whether uh, numbers related to the center or about torture in Lebanon in general? Yeah, there is no official statistic about torture. Uh, you know that it's uh, not in Lebanon only, but if I want to speak about what, uh, how many we receive in our centers per year, yeah, I can give an idea. But on the Lebanese level, it's impossible. You know, but uh, uh, because nobody nobody declare about it, nobody speak about it. Uh, it's uh, even with the state and the government bodies in different uh, police agencies, they are in the denial. Always there is no torture practice. Yeah, but uh, for research, it's around more than uh, uh, on yearly basis. We have more than one thousand uh, now because we are working also with Syrian refugees, not only inside the jail. Because our organizations working inside the jail also in, in, in Lebanon, and uh, we, we we targeted more than 400 on yearly basis inside the jail as victims of torture also. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, actually, Welcome. Question, Thank you. Thank uh, you. A question from. I will. I will give the. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, a question from Christina Jones. She's saying that uh, we know that in Lebanon people speak different, many languages. And she's asking if uh, trauma experience is better addressed in the language in which the torture has happened or in English or French uh, as a second language uh, that would be maybe better to address the situation. 
Can you repeat the question, please? So when you address... In English or in French? But in Arabic... Uh, so I think that this question is coming from the angle of asylum seeker. So if you were to document, for example, in the U.S. an asylum seeker, would you? Uh, is it better, in your opinion, to address the traumatic experience in the original language in which torture has happened, or in English or French? Yeah, they are Arabic speaker, of course. The majority of our patients are Arabic from the Gulf Arabic, from Iraq, from Sudan, from Egypt, from Lebanon. So, but somebody asked me a question, if he can ask in French, for sure he can ask in French. So for me, yes, I don't know for the attendees if you can ask in French. I prefer talking in French, so for me it's easier. <laughs> you can release me. But for, for the patient, yeah. it's better. Yeah. 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 La, la question est, euh, est-il mieux pour le patient s'il parle dans une autre langue de sa expérience traumatique ou bien, euh, ou bien si c'est mieux qu'il parle dans sa langue natale? Ah. The, this is different from other countries, you know, some, for some people, for some very, very few people, we, they make documentation, for example, they are not... Uh, Arab talking, so for example from Nigeria or from some, I don't know where, from Africa. But, you know, uh, we have also trained uh, interpreters uh, according to Istanbul Protocol to intervene in a good way. Uh, if not, also, maybe they could intervene um, uh, in the way they harm the patient. So we have uh, to make a lot of, uh, 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 like uh, awareness session about how to deal with patients and how, what is the role the, of the interpreter and everything. But most of our patients are Arab speaking. Arab spoke, speaking. Well, thank you. We, we have a last question, Sana. Uh, we're, uh, we're almost over with the webinar. So the last question is asking, is from Sue Simon, the director of the Forensic Training Institute, and she's asking if you can talk more about the challenge of balancing the need to obtain useful information for documentation and the concern of uh, the re-trauma for the survivor. How do you manage that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. We have to... Uh, I, you know, it's normal and it's uh, very... Um, uh, it's very clear in Istanbul protocol, some patients, when they came to our center, they see us like uh, conference transference or counter transference, or they have expectations, for example, how I be with them, or how, for example, my colleague will be. He is uh, empathic, he is good, he is, uh, for example, uh, sadistic. Uh, well, what is the, the, for example, the profession? Uh, uh, who they enjoy to let people talk about uh, their uh, their destiny and their sadness. It's uh, a lot of uh, question and interrogation in uh, the mind of the patient about uh, about this team or about psychologists or about everybody. So uh, when we make documentation, we have to make sure not to let uh, the patient uh, relieve the trauma because it's very difficult. There is some technique, for example, for therapy like night, narrative exposure therapy. This is we expose, uh, we expose uh, patient to relieve the trauma and all, uh, and all the, uh, the, the events, all the events, even the very hard uh, feelings. But when we are documenting the torture, we have to, to make sure not to, for this reason, we have to take into consideration the balance between our needs to take information and the patient needs. Sometimes he, he asks us, for example, uh, I, I cannot say, I can come tomorrow. For sure I tell him. Sometimes they ask us, they want to, to for example, smoke a cigarette. Sometimes they ask us. They are really, <laughs> sometimes they, they try to, for example, starting by joking. It's nothing happened, but after when they try to talk about trauma, they feel really de depressed and, uh, and like uh, 
a lot of feelings come came to to their uh, to their mind. So we have to to make sure not to let him receive the trauma. Well, thank you, Sana. Because it's very helpful. We don't have to ask an interrogation question. We don't have to. Ask we don't have to have also a barrier between us and him, for example, stand uh, like uh, interrogators, for example, uh, in front of a desk or, for example, like a, a lot of... Uh, we have all, all the things. We have to make uh, a trust um, welcome, welcoming. I mean, uh, when they are ca coming to, to the center, they, they feel um, the empathy and, uh, and the welcome issues. It's not like... Uh, we don't have to let them wait. There are uh, many factors who let uh, patients feel like uh, re-traumatizing, for example, sometimes you are busy a little bit to let the patient be, but if he is victim of torture, never. We have to establish a bond of trust between us and them. Um, okay, one, one other question is coming from our colleague uh, Paul Paul Chamba. Uh, Elle demande, est-il facile pour les médecins hommes d'examiner les femmes et vice-versa? So somebody is asking if is it easy for you to document for female documenters to document male uh, uh, alleged victims of torture and vice versa? You know, you, you know sometimes, sometimes I, I, I think that as, uh, as a psychologist, Sometimes, for example, people ask, I don't want to see, for example, female, I don't want to see Muslim, I don't want to see Christian, or I don't want to see tall, or I don't want to see short, or a lot of uh, things. He had fears because he came, he had a memory about uh, his past, uh, uh, his past uh, trauma. So he, he asked us sometimes, he or she asked us sometimes. For me, I can document uh, all kinds of uh, torture and uh, ill treatment because uh, it's not new for us uh, and uh, I am, uh, I mean, trained uh, to do that. It's easy for me, but it's not easy for patients to accept uh, maybe gender or to accept or to accept me or sometimes people come to the center they told no, I, want, I don't want to see Sana, she's very, for example, hard or she's not nice the choice of the patient is our priority our patient deal with our center deal with the patient they are they there like they are they like they go to the private clinic he can choose me we can choose another people even he can choose somebody outside our center uh, Sana if you can uh, give the same answer again in French but also uh... he see that it's his priority and you start to make like of confidence. What? Uh, actually, I think our colleague is from Congo, so if you can give the answer in French, that would be helpful. And this will be the last answer. I apologize for uh, Khaled and Malak, but uh, hopefully you will be able to get your responses by email. I, I don't know. I don't understand anything. I don't hear. Oh, I see. Okay, no problem. Well, uh, oh, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Well, um, I think that we're going to bring this first webinar to an end. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. This webinar has been recorded, so uh, the link uh, will be available for those who weren't able to attend this uh, live. But uh, thank you so much again for attending and for signing up. We will be uh, in touch again for the next webinar very soon. Thanks to Dr. Sana uh, and Dr. Suzanne Jabour and everyone at the Restart Center for uh, making uh, this possible. And uh, uh, hopefully you'll hear from us very soon. Thank you. Thank you for you to make this possible. <laughs> it's you who make this possible. Really, we, we, we did uh, hard work to make it possible. You did a lot of work to make it possible. Really, you are a strong man. Yes, I like to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sana. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.